Today is a very big milestone in the history of Bone Hall Clinic. It is 35 years today since Louise Brown, the world's first IVF baby, was born. And we are celebrating it as Founders Day. We are uh, dedicating this day to the memory of Patrick Stepto and Robert Edwards, who founded this clinic. And there will be an unveiling of a plaque in their memory uh, at this clinic. Well, today is a brilliant day for all of us because we're celebrating two things. Firstly, 35 years of IVF here at Bourne Hall and also the dedication of the building to those two great pioneers of IVF, Patrick Stapto and Bob Edwards. Well, um, when Dad first started working, bear in mind that was quite a time before Louise Brown was actually born, infertility really wasn't taken that seriously. And so infertile couples had very little hope of a child. So to actually spend all those years actually researching something that many people considered something that should not be done anyway, and of course there were all the ethical issues about what they were actually doing and whether it was wrong or right, and there were a lot of jokes made in the newspaper. People really thought that they were growing babies in test tubes. So they had a lot of criticism to overcome and a lot of science to do to actually get to that point. Devastating. Um, I think like any person or any, any woman who gets married and thinks plans ahead and part of that plan is to have a family, when you're told um, that you can't have children, um, it's, it's really devastating because I had sort of planned my whole future around having a family. I was visiting a friend in Stirling who was a doctor and um, there was a, a coffee table um, and there was a copy of The Lancet on the table and um, while my friend was away getting making a cup of tea I just happened to notice that there was um, the list of things, that, the articles inside and one of the articles was on infertility. So of course <laughs> being in that state myself I, I looked at it and it was all about Patrick Steptoe and Bob Edwards getting together to help women um, to hopefully have their own children. And when I looked at what, what it was describing, it fitted. I was just absolutely the right category for it. So um, I, tr I followed it up after that. So at the time before Louise Brown was born was a time of huge excitement for the whole family. It's something Dad had been working for years towards. Um, we knew it was also going to be a very difficult time because the eyes of the world's press were upon them. Their critics were just waiting for something to go wrong. Um, so it was a difficult as well as a very exciting time. And just before, before the birth of Louise Brown, we went up to the Yorkshire Dales, which was one of Dad's favourite places for a bit of peace and relaxation. Um, and then when he got the call from Patrick, he went off down to Oldham and left us there up in the Yorkshire Dales and when we finally got the news it was just fantastic. Huge relief all round that she was a perfect baby girl and everything had just gone fantastically so it was just an amazingly memorable time. I am now handing the baby to Dr Edwards whose brains, skill and perseverance has made this birth possible. He started this work some 20 years ago. I think that Bob has always been um, almost the most important person in, our, in my life and my son's life because of obviously for what he did for us, but also the support and the kindness and um, the involvement that he has shown in our lives ever since Alistair was born. So I can't describe really how much he meant, you know, he has meant to us in our lives. Uh, my memories of uh, very early days of Professor Edwards uh, growing up was of a very uh, kind, caring, uh, honest, and, well, a, fe a very human person. It was, uh, uh, maybe slightly eccentric, but <laughs> in, in such a great, fun, genuine way. I mean, you could not honestly meet a much a more nicer man, I think. But it's one of like one of my uh, 
early like funny funny moments of being with them was uh, was being in, in, in his old Mercedes in the back of his car and he was demonstrating his uh, his air conditioning system to me which was both back windows open and me being blown about in the back so I mean he had a very great down to our sense of humor and yeah this I was I was always in complete awe of him to be honest so. well he was just like a granddad sort of person to me um Obviously, when I was when I got older, Mum explained everything and um, how they helped him and how they helped Mum in that. So um, yeah, it just felt like sort of a yeah, like a granddad, sort of very special. And obviously, without their help, Mum wouldn't have had me and obviously all the thousands of other children that have been born. So uh, yeah, definitely just like a granddad. He was one of the pioneers in the communication of science and I think that was an amazing achievement. But he was also very early in the field of reproductive bioethics. I mean, he was very concerned that only ethical treatment should, should occur and he, wanted, he placed that at the centre of his work. So he was a pioneer in three fields, I think. not just the science but also the ethics and the, and the public communication of science. And he's amazing. He's also a great writer, a great publisher, amazing man, really. Well, um, after Louise Brown was born, I think we all thought things would then get a little bit easier for Dad and that they would get funding on the NHS. Patrick would perhaps be able to come down to Payne, Cambridge and they'd be able to set up an NHS clinic. But in the event, that didn't happen. So they knew the only way they could actually progress and take things further was actually to set up a private clinic. So that's what they did. And I remember actually coming up to Bourne Hall with Dad um, and talking to the owner here in the very early days when they were looking for a place to buy and the transformation of Bourne in, then, in those days to the thriving clinic today is just fantastic to see. Anybody working in the field of reproductive biology knew about the birth of Louise Brown and the really exciting work that Bob was doing. I joined in 1983 because I wanted to be part of that development. I wanted to be part of the translation of her research uh, ideas into a clinical practice. And both Bob and Patrick were really inspirational leaders in our development of IVF as it is today. This room that we are in today used to be Patrick Steptoe's office and his consultation room and there was a great big oak table here in front with a with his chair behind that and this is the room that I was interviewed in for my first job here way back in December 1983 when I was a young gynecologist in my 30s. Um, it was an intimidating experience coming into Patrick Steptoe's presence and being interviewed in this room but I was delighted to be accepted for a job here straight after that. The only memory I've got of Patrick is when we went, Natalie was toddling around, um, we went to his house and uh, obviously they had a big swim pool in the back garden and being kids we sort of, uh, me and Nat's sister is messing about and I threatened to push her in <laughs> and Patrick went, no you're not and I was like, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of the only because he um he died when I was ten so, but no I definitely remember that he scared me half to death, <laughs> just this big boomy voice and it was like ooh okay I'm not I'm just gonna not do anything sit here. He was an old fashioned gynaecologist very strict in what he did and but very meticulous in his work. He was passionate about his patients and used to treat them extremely well. He took very detailed histories from them examined them thoroughly, and he was very honest with them about their chances of conception. Um, Patrick was um, a stickler for doing things correctly and for newcomers to learn the procedure by watching him for a long, long time. Um, in fact, when I joined here in 1984, it was almost a year before he let me actually do a procedure myself. Until that time, I was following him around and uh, learning from him and watching the way he did things. When I first came here in the early 80s, the success rates were probably in the region of about 15 to 20 percent, and it has been growing uh, slowly since then. Today we have reached success rates of over 50 percent 
in women under the age of 37, which is excellent uh, compared to the old days. And these success rates continue to grow. The last 35 years have seen us uh, improving all the time in terms of success for IVF. In the early days, back in the early 80s, we were delivering around about a 10% take-home baby rate. Now that figure is near 50% and consistently 50%. In order to achieve that, there have been huge changes in, the, in the, our understanding of the conditions in which we have to keep the embryos. And there have also been clinical practice changes, like the advent of ultrasound uh, in terms of imaging the ovary and the growing eggs within it, and also um, in terms of the treatment of male infertility. We've come a long way in our understanding of how to manage poor sperm. One of the major breakthroughs was the accidental finding that you could take a single sperm and put it into the egg, achieve embryo development and healthy children as a result. This technique was called ICSI and opened up uh, an opportunity to those suffering from male factor infertility to become parents. So there's very little um, use of donor sperm today uh, compared to the old, uh, old days and we have ways of retrieving sperm even in situations which seemed hopeless in the old days. That's been a big uh, change. Bob and Patrick persisting and keeping going. So, uh, I would like Louise and Alistair to open the... Uh, no, but just do that. See that thing on the side there? Ready? <laughs> Today we try to maintain the work here exactly the way Stepto would have liked us to maintain it. Of course we have moved on in the scientific uh, breakthroughs that have come about since then and we've moved on with um, some of the treatment options we offer patients but the spirit of the treatment and the, and the ethos of what we do remains what Patrick Stepto wanted in the early days. As well as being Chief Executive of Bourne Hall in the UK, it's also my privilege to be Chief Executive of Bourne Hall International. Bourne Hall International has established three centres of excellence, two in India and one in Dubai serving the Middle East. These three new members of the Bourne Hall family absolutely typify the founding uh, philosophy of Patrick and Bob. Uh, yeah, to everyone in coaching uh, daily in Dubai, I think it's uh, I think it's amazing the work that you're doing out there and to keep uh, keeping the legacy of uh, Bourne, Bourne Hall and what Patrick and Bob uh, started over here. Uh, I, think, I think, yeah, definitely keep up the good work. You're doing us all proud and it's amazing to be part of all that that legacy. Uh, I'm very much uh, looking forward to coming over to see you with my mother. Just want to say hello to everybody at Coaching Delhi in Dubai. We'll see you all soon. Can't wait to meet you all.